مرحبا جميعا والان ندعو مستر ارمن جاربيجان مؤسس والمدير التنفيذي لشركه شيد كرافت للنقاش عن دور التكنولوجيا في تحسين اسلوب حياتنا. Good afternoon everyone. Now we welcome Mr. Arman, the founder and CEO of Shadecraft Robotech. He's going to be discussing about the role of technology in improving our lives. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, the foundation. MBRF for inviting me to this session. Uh, it's an honor to be here, especially among all of the great uh, thinkers and scientists and other minds that are here to amass in this incredible summit. Uh, it's super exciting for me to have an opportunity to share a little bit more about, basically from our perspective, about AI and robotics. Uh, as MBRF asked me to do this presentation, I decided to change it up a little bit especially after the amazing uh, show that you just saw by Jason Silva, I realized what I needed to express would be a little bit different. I need the clicker, actually. Thank you. So I've been thinking quite a bit in the last couple of weeks, what is it that I'm really going to present? Um, because somehow it feels as if it's, it's ironic that the stuff that we're trying to explain at the same speed in which I'm supposed to explain it to you is already being transmitted faster than I can say it. It's exactly the stuff that Jason was talking about right now. I didn't necessarily want to talk about how we're actually creating robots, how are we, how are we inventing stuff. This is stuff that you, every single one of you can find out on the internet. So what I was about to express and uh, basically about three, four weeks ago, I decided to change it up a little bit. So I hope you guys can bear with me, especially in light of the amazing uh, presentation that was just given. I also watched the general session prior to this, and uh, it was interesting that one of the panelists brought up something that was in my presentation. I was less concerned about expressing the obvious to you, because that's what a lot of people tend to do in presentations, and it becomes it's almost like you're sitting there listening to stuff that you can find out faster on the internet yourselves. So what would I give you that you already don't know or cannot find out? And that was really the core issue where I went internally and in thinking about what is it that I'm supposed to say that possibly, first and foremost, with all due respect, I don't think that there are any futurists. There are only prophets that have come in our past, which we respect and love. Um, so I am just one feeble mind with my perspective that I'd like to share with you today. What I'm going to share with you, you could not find on the internet. And that's how I catered my presentation for you. So I'm more interested in telling you how to actually bridge that gap to be able to play along with machines. We have <coughs> physicians that sat down and talked a few, uh, maybe an hour ago, explaining how they're doing surgery. And the mediator asked, what about the people that, uh, for example, are laborers? Are they going to be replaced by robots? And Shadecraft, basically, in my company, we create robots and we work with AI. Actually, I was curious to, to ask the physician if he realizes that his job is basically at the same level as possibly the laborer himself. Why would a robot that is sentient need a physician with goggles when it's doing surgery on a patient. That's probably where emotion doesn't matter because I personally would not want to have a doctor that has had maybe a bad morning, has not eaten well that day, has had an argument, is emotional doing surgery on me. I'd much rather take all that surgery, the sort of emotional stuff aside and have them focus specifically on the issue at hand, which is my health. So I basically catered my presentation um, to a couple of simple things. <clears throat> and I really don't have answers, but I have questions. So I'm more interested in dialogue. And that's what the Knowledge Summit is about. It's about dialogue. How do we communicate these ideas? I'm really interested in what you guys have to ask me. I want to learn from you as much as possibly you may learn from me. Where is another question. Obviously, I'm not going to have profound answers for you. 
This is a journey I'm going to take you through to explain a little bit more. And how, which is my own feeble, small version, to explain to you possibly how is it that we can actually look at the future. I already explained this. What information can I provide you that you already don't know? Imagine, I mean, I, I, this, it would be ridiculous for me to sit here and show you amazingly beautiful images of robots and AI and digital information moving around and CG uh, utilizing certain programs that you know my, my office uses all the time for presentations. So I thought, let's just scale it back a little bit. Let me just use a blackboard as a background. Let's make it simple. Let's have a little bit of silence so that I can explain something a little bit different, something a little bit more emotional. Because that's, that's the key to the human mind. I'm going to use some references and quotes from one of the greatest minds in history, Einstein. And it is never outdated. And it's so relevant to technology and innovation today. You're already not here. Some of you are already looking at your phones. And honestly, that's basically the point. And so I feel like things are moving so fast that I have to give you something slightly different. I don't know if you guys know about this, but oh, by the way, this presentation is, can you widen it, please? I didn't even look back. I saw that the monitor here was like that, but <clears throat> when we get to the videos, it's with my clicker. What do you want me to do with it? Click it. I know, but it's squeezed. The ratio. It's all right. That's fine. It's more interesting anyway. Um, if you can imagine. I mean, Jason had a much more beautiful visual description of that. I did not want to do that, otherwise I would actually clip all this beautiful art from the internet and just show you guys just how the world is progressing at like crazy speed, right? So what I wanted to do, that's interesting. Okay, I think the one, no, this is now too old. <laughs> let's, let's scale back. Anyway, if we can all imagine <clears throat> that the entire evolution of our planet happened in one year, just Think about this for a second without looking at beautiful images on the screen. Humans appeared 15 minutes ago. So just imagine that scale and difference. And the last 100 years of our evolution happened in one minute, including everything. So imagine where does AI and robotics fall? In nanoseconds. That's how fast it's happening. So imagine in one year what the progress of this hockey stick what Jason was talking about, exponential growth is. And it's very true. Okay. Everything's gonna be really squeezed. I'm concerned about the video, so I'd like you to open it up because some of the videos and images are gonna be a little bit off, but it doesn't really matter. Um, this is what it feels like when we look at stuff from the past. Doesn't it feel like time's even slower than it should be? Reading newspapers, waiting for something to appear tomorrow in, in the news. I'm going to pause that. In the time that I'm trying to explain this to you, these are probably ideas that are floating all around the world, new inventions that are being made even faster than we can imagine right now. So I kind of feel it's going to be outdated what I'm about to tell you. The only thing that I can tell you that won't be outdated is what's inside. And you know what? The internet and machines right now do not have access to that. It's the right side, possibly the right side of the brain, because I'm not a neuroscientist. There's a lot of controversy about what side of the brain that's on. But it's about emotion, will, love, respect, those things that cause humans to create things. And it's not talked about very often. This is why I really appreciate some of Einstein's quotes. I'm definitely not, uh, I don't like labels, so some people say just because I wrote a science fiction novel, I'm a futurist, or I'm this or that. I'm not an architect, I'm not an industrial designer, I'm not a fine artist, although I do all of those. Uh, I'm not in robotics. I like to think of myself as moving energy from one state to another, because I'm preparing myself for what's about to come. So Carlos Perez wrote this, and it was a little bit disturbing for me. He said, is DL the last human invention? We all talk about AI. Okay, AI is a very common word, but deep learning, as you know, if you're in universities, you know that this is the next thing. I mean, really, when we're talking about machines that help in nanotechnology, et cetera, et cetera, those machines will be invented by machines. That's one thing we need to realize today. 
Analysts aren't talking about that. Physicians aren't talking about the fact that the very machines that they are using today will be invented by the machine to be used by the machine. So this is a very different type of evolution. It is perhaps, and I'm, I'm definitely an optimist, so I'm just going to take you through this path and, and hopefully please ask me any questions. What should we focus on? This is a really profound question and it's something that I ask myself. You know, we, we are a very successful startup in California and we're surrounded by all these great ideas and, and it's, it's wonderful to be able to share those and meet people all around the world who have similar ideas and inventions. Uh, you're living, basically, we are all here in one of the most technologically advanced cities in the world, and it's amazing to have this. But a lot of people don't really focus on that. Can you imagine your, this is something that people ask, actually the panelists asked this, and, and it's really ironic uh, that he asked because he's, he's the chair at Singularity University. So I'm curious, and I was a little curious to know that this is something he's thinking about. I wanted to know what is it that he is thinking about. What is his solution for this? So I, I have to think about this because I have two sons. I have a very different viewpoint from my wife who's sitting in the room right now about the education of my children. The other day my son was actually putting decimal points uh, in, in basically in the mathematical uh, uh, work that he was, homework that he was doing with a pencil and, and Somebody was getting upset, uh, his teacher was getting upset that he wasn't putting the decimal points in the right place. That's not important anymore. Guys, we have to think differently now. We shouldn't be thinking about, yes, it's beautiful to do handwritten stuff, it's, it's wonderful, but imagine the clock that I just showed you. This is how fast things are developing. If we start to focus on things like that, then children are gonna be lost. This is one of the, they are, basically our future. This is what we need to think about. Here you go. One of my favorite quotes. If you can explain it simply, that means you don't understand. I don't think any of us understands right now the implication. I mean, I'm in the field of robotics. I'm creating robots that, in fact, we just launched one at Jitex. It was very successful. We're hoping to bring our robots here as well protect people from the sun, help to improve human life outdoors, to help people that are sick, people that are older. That's the mission of my company. I would like to improve human life outdoors for as long as I can, for as long as we are going to be needing robots in that way. I probably won't be around 50 years from now, or I may be. I don't know what it's going to be like to be living in a digital world, but that's not something that I want to ask myself today. We have certain things we need to address and deal with today, and that's what interests me. I'm definitely not a neuroscientist, but I ask my, myself these questions. Am I a psychologist? Do I have to be a psychologist? Do I have to think? Yes, we do have to think about these things. It's not enough anymore to think about your children going to engineering school. It's not enough anymore to think about your children doing mathematics in school. You have to talk to them about profound ideas. You have to explore interesting ideas that expand their mind in a way that machines today are not able to do. This is a more elastic way of thinking based on emotion. This is a gift that's been given to us. I wrote a quote that I'd like to read to you. Actually, I wrote the quote actually after the general session that happened today. And I'd like to read that quote to you at the end of this. What do we see? What do we, what do we really see? Do we really see this progress that Jason's talking about? Or are we just going about in our lives just thinking about, okay, you know, it's fine, my children's going to school, you know, now they're gonna go to college, what are they gonna study? Are we really embracing the idea of this exponential explosion of technology? It's going faster than we can imagine. And by the way, it is basically gonna reinvent itself. We just have to move alongside of it. There are some things I know, and I can, I can certainly tell you, uh, I do have very strong opinions about certain things, and I want to show you what my opinions are. We don't need this. Um, I don't need, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this, stupid products that are designed on a daily basis by a bunch of engineers who are not really thinking about really what they are doing. Just because an object is smart, it doesn't mean there's anything interesting about it. A deodorant that tells me when it's finished. I don't need to know this. 
just because we're living in, a, in li really a golden age of technology today, where if we put a couple of sensors inside a product, that sensor can tell me a, a multitude of things, but that's not enough. What, what are you addressing with what you're creating? And you know something? What is really sad is that the structure of what we celebrate today, imagine all of the venture capitalists in the world right now funding companies like this because all they care about is their three-year return. They're not really going to help that child that is trying to help humanity by coming up with a particular idea that is not going to be monetized in three years. This is what we need to invest in. This is what we need to think about if we real, really are going to make a change. The whole idea of what Jason's talking about today is really in our hands. That's what I want you guys to think about. It really is in our hands right now, what we are doing with what we are given. That's, that's actually the greatest thing the human mind can do, is to evolve and adapt. We've done that. So we just need to do that with technology. There's another example. Why? I mean, of course, I definitely don't need a comb, but I mean, it's not just because of that, but I mean, just think about it. Why do I need a smart comb? Guess what this information is going to do? All of that information about how the, the humidity of your hair, the health of your hair is being collected that a supercomputer in the future that has, you know, deep neural networks is going to amass all this information for what? I mean, what, what matters right now with the hair years from now when we're actually, if we really are going to go into singularity? That information is absolutely useless today because we have people that are hungry around the world. We, are peop we have people that actually are in war. If robotics needs to really help humanity, it needs to solve problems like that. It's not just about creating products that are addressing frivolous needs. This is what I, this, I wrote this because it's really important and I asked this to some people. Uh, actually, a, a jazz musician asked me this uh, years ago when I was younger. He said, are, when you're listening to jazz music, do you just listen to the sound or do you hear it? Are we hearing what's happening in technology? Are we hearing the fact that the doctors that are sitting there are not going to have a job? They're talking about what they're going to do, but they're not going to do it, trust me. They're not going to do it. Doctors and lawyers are going to go pretty much as fast, in my opinion, as laborers. In fact, laborers might stay longer. Because who's going to fix the concrete in a specific area of the city? Who's going to mix that water? It's not going to be a whole ton of robots doing that stuff. Humans are going to have jobs. Doctors, on the other hand, are in deep danger. Nobody's talking about that. Engineers are creating tools, just like the paint that he was talking about with Van Gogh, or, or engineers are creating the piano. But what we need today is Mozart. How do you create Mozart? Because the machines, they can't do that. Why? Because they don't feel. And that is one of the greatest gaps in neuroscience. I'm sorry if you guys are scientists in neuroscience and, and you're like really thinking that I'm just completely out of school. It's written about, with great thinkers around the world, that this is going to be one of the hardest, hardest barriers for machines to overcome. The human mind. It's too complex. We don't think like machines. They're faster, they're better in a zillion things. I haven't used, basically, have you ever, have you recently in the last 20, 30 years, have you actually uh, multiplied things by hand? No, we use calculators. I mean, that's, we can, engineers create objects, Inventors have to dream. Your children have to dream. They have to be inspired by emotion, love, passion, respect, these things. This is what's going to change humanity. It's a responsibility to mankind and our planet first. And I really appreciate all of you know different governments around the world um, that are pushing for solar, wind energy, renewable energy, trying to help people. Of course, medicine, it's fantastic when, you know, basically we get into nanotechnology, uh, you know, playing with genes and helping, you know, doing 3D printing of organs, all of that's wonderful. But it, it has to be for humans. After a certain point, do this whole cycle in your head, okay? So we have self-driving cars right now. That's really interesting. Do machines need self-driving cars? No. So at, at a certain point, those humans that are in those cars, the machines are going to make a determination if, why am I transporting this person? Why am I doing farming for this person? 
What we're not really thinking about is how are we looking at these machines? Are we teaching? Are we working? Is there enough funding happening? Like Elon Musk is funding a company that is trying to understand how to protect AI when it basically goes askew. It's going to be uncontrollable. You know, I'm, I don't want to paint the doomsday picture, but it's reality. We have to care about those things. We have to teach machines. If we're going to teach them about emotion, there's great companies around the world that are trying to study your emotions based on what you're buying. That's less important. They should try to study love, which is something psychologists can't even describe today. That's my personal opinion. Biomimetics, I'm just going to go through these pretty fast because uh, Jason already talked about some wonderful things if you saw his session. Um, it's an inspiration for my company. I mean, obviously nature uh, is an incredible inspiration. Biomimetics is the way that we take biomimetry and apply it to products. We created a product called Sunflower that follows the sun. We didn't make it look like a sunflower. But we studied why sunflowers are the way they are. They protect their enzymes. We put the intelligence of the robot right behind the shade. As it shades the human, it also shades its own system to stay alive. It uses the sun and the movement of the sun. I mean, these are more stoic images. Until today, we're still trying to understand how bees, the flight of bees, which is an abstract mathematics, has any correlation to Euclidean geometry. There's mysteries in nature that are fascinating. Children should learn about these things. Tell them that when bees fly, they can actually dictate where they need to go. And mathematics today, even though at a subatomic level can understand that, it cannot make that gap between Euclidean geometry and subatomic particles. That's fascinating. I mean, there is so much power and awe. Robots are being designed by nature, you already know. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly because they're, they can get quite boring. I don't know if uh, some of you guys know, but there's really interesting studies being done in robots that are not really using motors. I mean, it's, we're already going into that, that uh, direction. So this is the most important thing for me. How do we adapt? Because I don't think that a lot of people talk about this. They, they basically state the obvious, all this incredible stuff that's happening around us, but they don't talk about it. what is going to make us different so that we can actually change a little bit. So my question is, <clears throat> how am I going to invent alongside another machine? That's my question. Because the machine is going to be invented, so I'm going to have to invent with the machine. Maybe the machine is going to invent a little bit differently than me. And I'm trying to understand that delta. That delta between myself and future machines is the key that I am looking for as an inventor. This is one of the most powerful quotes that Einstein ever wrote, in my opinion. Imagination is knowledge. And I'm, I'm wondering if maybe maybe if a few years from now, this is going to be called the imagination summit. Knowledge is going to be surpassed. The knowledge that we think we know is already surpassed by machines. So what's left is that imagination. It's that delta. It's things inspired by emotion. So the human mind is a really fascinating thing. I'm definitely not an expert to talk about the human mind, but I want you guys to study it because it's very interesting what machines are doing right now and how different that is from the way. And by the way, I was reading an article on the plane coming here, uh, which was very interesting, artificial psychology. It's already happening. Machines are trying to understand what's going on in those minds that basically create. So I was wondering, machine, of course neuroscientists want to understand Rothko. They want to understand de Kooning. They want to understand Beethoven. They want to understand why Beethoven created that. There's a reason why Beethoven created that. There's a reason why de Kooning created that. And I'm going to take you through a little journey in my own mind of how I create. You guys look at this image. The machine looks at it as well. A machine can look at five million of these and basically look at and analyze the hues of this image down to its pixelation. It knows basically how many people are drinking Coke, what is the sugar content, how many Cokes are being dispersed around the world at this very second a machine can know. We don't know any of that stuff. How do you guys see this image? You immediately look, it's all around you. An inventor or somebody that thinks differently looks at this image in a completely different way. 
I see the sound. I hear the sound. I feel the taste. I imagine the fact that if I roll this creatively, maybe I can actually take the logo and read it backwards on the pavement. I know what it feels like to scratch the paint off. A machine doesn't know that. A machine's not imagining that I'm going to scrape the paint off of this or clean it with acetone. It's not going to think about that. He's, the machine's not going to think to take this, clean it with acetone, use it as a pencil holder. It's not going to think about the fact that I can take a million of these and attach them on the surface of a building to create a reflective surface. I can go on and on with every single image. I'm taking you now into my mind, the way I look at objects. I asked my team to actually just get some random stuff, and I wish that maybe you guys can just put some stuff up so I can do the same exercise. It's an orange. Okay? And and when I used to teach a course called What Box. It was about elastic thinking in design. It's very important. I'm looking at this orange, I can travel inside its veins. That's what's the golden age of technology. So VR is going to allow us to go in this, and that's what Jason was talking about. And that's beautiful. I want to travel inside the veins of this orange and experience what it is. The only difference is that a machine cannot taste it. A machine doesn't remember in the mountains in Armenia when I was visiting my country. A woman plucked an orange from a tree and walked over to the car and gave it to me and said, here my son. And I remember that emotional connection to that piece of orange that she gave me. A machine will only pretend that it knows that because it will study it. In fact, the fact that this is going to go digital, a machine will learn that one day. Deep learning today will basically not today, in a few years, we'll take exactly what I'm telling you and try to understand what do I mean when I say travel inside an arm, orange. And Armin spoke to me about that. And basically that's what DL will do. But today I'm telling you that my mind is allowing me to travel in this orange in a completely different way. I'm imagining what it would feel like if I was cold inside one of the, one of the granules I use that as an inspiration to design a building. I use that as an inspiration to design a robot to create another hum human emotional interaction. This is how I will evolve in the machine age. Because when machines take me into this orange, this is the key, guys. The delta. This is the delta. Nobody explains what will we do. This is what I think we will do. We will look inside this orange and travel at a molecular, molecular level inside the orange with VR glasses but the beauty of the human mind, that basically is God-given. The beauty of the human mind will allow us to then think beyond that. We can't see it today, but that's what evolution is about. We will go to singularity one day, but while we do that, in that journey, we will be able to transform, because there is something special about the human being. I believe that. another example. We see a toothbrush. I see translucent plastic. I can take that toothbrush and design an entire year's worth of clothing, an entire year's worth of products inspired by the movement. I'm, I'm remembering the way it feels. I'm not just looking at it as an object. It's a contextual thing. This is the difference between my right brain and my left brain, perhaps. And the left brain is actually a part of the intelligence. You know, it's very important. You can't, you can't have either one separately. But it's the combination of the two that makes it interesting. All these different things that we look at. You all look at this glass and it's just, immediately you look at an object, but go beyond it. We will definitely adapt. There is no question that we will adapt. And that adaptation is based on our own strength and our own mind. And the way we actually look at our environment and we will find new solutions in the technological age. Because really, it's a beautiful time right now. It's in our hands what we do with the technology that's given to us. I just think we need to be a little bit more responsible. This is another one that I love by Einstein. We always talk about stuff that is done today. Okay, this is great, this car is made, this thing is you know, created. We don't value the emotional aspect, which is a gift, which is very important. This is a video I want to share with you that I had in one of my presentations. This will sum up everything I'm talking about, why a human will evolve in the machine age. 
this child, imagine this is all a technology, the stuff that we can play with, sensors and engineers looking at this. If this is a future engineer, which he probably may be, if he's the Mozart of the future, he's going to show you exactly what he's going to do. He doesn't want to play in the sandbox because he's human. He's not a machine. He will explore in a way that the machine, basically, maybe in the future, we will teach machines how to explore like us. But today, that is the Delta, guys. If you're thinking about your children, allow them to be free. Allow them to be creative. He left the sandbox. His mom is going to push him to go back in there. She thinks it's completely on him. He wants to mess it up. All he cares about is the environment around him. He doesn't care about the sandbox anymore. He's exploring. This is human evolution. When the sandbox becomes singularity, this is what we will do. Don't eat dirt. Do your math. Go to engineering school. It's all the same, guys. Let your children listen to music. Let them think about profound ideas. Dirt, yeah. She sees dirt. What do you think he sees? If he's a creator, he doesn't see dirt. He sees beyond it. It's That's food, right, mom, it's but she thinks it's dirt. 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 Because we're conditioned. If we're conditioned and we continue to be conditioned, machines will overtake us. I'm an optimist because I don't believe that we will be it's overtaken dirt. because of the power of the human mind. But we need to adapt. So we have to forget the stoic things that we teach our children. I came up with this slogan for our company. And yet, it has, because we designed robots for the outdoor environment to help, basically, human evolution outdoors, uh, it was an important thing for me to write. It's just like God milk, just do it. And it just came to me one day. But it means a lot more, because this embodies exactly everything that I think about and the engineers and the other inventors in my company think about. We want to step outside. We want to play outside of the sandbox. That is the human evolution right there. If we are going to transform and invent with machines, we have to step outside of the generic things we are doing right now because we, it's too slow. Remember the newspaper I showed you guys. That's going to be way too slow. Machines will surpass us if we don't step outside. I wrote, uh, after the general session, I wrote something that I want to read to you guys. It's just a quote that I came up with today. I said, I do not want to sound like an outdated historian talking about what I am currently doing in the high-speed digital age we live in. The only current insight I can share is the personal and emotional aspect of my thoughts floating freely in the abstract realm and complexity of my own mind, which is a gift we all have been bestowed with. I want you guys to remember that. Thank you. I think I still have some time for some Q&A, so please. Yes. Maybe if there's a mic that I can give her, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Hi. I've always been very curious about the term artificial intelligence, because uh, you know, do you think that intelligence is artificial? Or does it exist naturally in the universe? And we've just developed an artificial way to harness it for our use, which is the way we're using solar energy, artificial use and wind energy, and so on. So when we are getting into the realm of artificial intelligence, because humans think that we are creating you know, intelligence artificially into machines, are we playing with something way bigger than what we even imagine at this moment? I'm sorry, what was the last question? Uh, when, we, when we think that we are creating artificial intelligence mm -hmm. as humans, uh, are we kind of misunderstanding what we are actually creating and are we playing with something way bigger than what we even have an understanding of? Um, that's a really philosophic question. Uh, I do have my opinions about that. Uh, it's something, like I said, we none of us really know. Um, I think that uh, I'm a believer that there's intelligence that exists in the universe. Uh, I believe in God. Uh, that makes a difference. Uh, and I believe that there's a grand design in the universe. So, 
in my opinion, maybe we are terming it wrong. Uh, it is artificial now. If it is artificial, it will not seem artificial. It will all become one at some point. Um, I don't think that I have answers. I have questions, but it's a really good question that you're asking. I don't think that I have uh, all the answers to what you're asking. Sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. Can you? Thank you for the talk. Maybe I need to put closer to my mouth. Is good? Yes. Uh, I've been listening a lot over the past couple of days, uh, trying to project, think about where technology is going. And it, it, occurs, it occurs to me. Uh, Great. It occurs to me that um, the limitation of where we will reach is not necessarily an ability limitation, but a theoretical. In other words, I think we will come to a point where we can uh, encode free will for automation, and at that point we will have to rein it in rather than, you know, rather than let it let it go. And I just want to see your thoughts on that particular thought. Um, you know, I think there's some really great minds in the world right now, including Stephen Hawking. Um, I respect tremendously. Elon Musk, uh, many people have, have told us about this, their, their fears. Uh, it is definitely, you know, free will is a very complex issue. Um, in some ways, I ask myself, were we supposed to know this? Were we, you know, distilled this knowledge? Was it a natural process of us to create artificial intelligence that then to teach us exactly how it was that the universe was created in the first place? Um, but I do believe that there's enough being played with irresponsibly today. Um, it could be a couple of brilliant children that are just working on this idea of free will, and the next thing they know is it just, it's out and the machine is working. Uh, it, I think if we don't really think responsibly, first at least about mankind and our planet, and the inventions we, we create, and have some ways of measuring uh, you know, that success and look for some ways to prevent it from going astray, that it might become an issue. Yes, please. I'm sorry. And you hold it closer, I can barely hear. In that context, don't you think it's probably time for us to step back a little? A lot of times, I think over the last hundred years, we found we go ahead with a brilliant idea. Twenty years down the line, we start figuring out that there are disadvantages to it or there are ramifications we haven't thought of. So, shouldn't with AI this be the right time for us to step back, stop the uh, exponential growth for a little bit and then evaluate where we are? That's why I put a pause uh, button on the uh, timer. <laughs> Um, it's a great question. I wish I wish we could pause it. Uh, I don't think that it's something that you could do, or any one of us can. It's already moving. It's moving faster than you can imagine. And and there's really no way. I mean, you may decide to do it. I think there's maybe some governments that would look at that, but that doesn't work because we're talking about an unembodied intelligence. That's what the cloud is. This intelligence, basically, when we when all this information about people's hair goes up into the cloud. That's not something that is an object that you can mold back and turn off anymore. It's not going to turn off. So our only evolutionary process is to basically be able to maybe strengthen the human mind and stop doing decimal points and stop telling children to actually start doing handwriting. If they're reading a book about ancient, for example, I'll give you an idea of where I think we are different. It's okay for, for children now to explore looking at a camera that's going into the Giza pyramids because he needs to watch that. He does not need to read the book. It needs to happen faster. As humans, we need to learn faster. We need, I think it's really about education. Two things that are the most important, in my opinion. Obviously, empathy, respect, love, the way we are brought up, our parents, that really will change the person that is going to invent things, to invent it for the benefit of mankind. That's number one, and those are my personal opinions. Number two, 
we need to change education completely. There's a lot of talk about changing education. I don't think people are really doing that. I think people are still hoping that their sons and daughters are going to go to engineering school. They should be looking at, show them abstract painting. I had a lot more quotes by painters, like Picasso. He said, I, you know, I, I can paint, I learned to paint like Rembrandt in four years, but it took him a lifetime to paint like a child. Let them explore things that are completely creative and outside of the sandbox. If, they, if we have any hope of being able to create and invent with, alongside machines and evolve and understand things, we, we're not going to code, guys. We are not, the coding is like, it's going to be almost like a historian talking about ancient stuff, really. Huh? Machines are going to code themselves. They don't need us to learn code. We need to think about that delta. We need to be inventive, visionaries, dreamers. We need to teach machines to become empathetic. That's our goal. How do we design a machine that has empathy? Free will will come. But we need to start thinking about those things, which are much more profound, very difficult for AI right now. Yes? Um, like, we know that for every action, we have a reaction. So, and for the um, making, um, basically, with technology, we're questioning our own physical evidence. So, we're, we're not becoming a body, we're becoming only a mind. So what what will be the the reaction of actually questioning our physical ability and only being uh, a mind in space? Um, I'm not sure if I completely understand the question. Um, like what would what do we think um, AI will like leave if uh, the only difference between AI and us as human beings is the way we think in our mind? So what is the reaction in like the, the, the long run? I'm not really sure if I have an answer to that, but I have questions. I mean, I, I've asked the question, uh, what happens when you actually can go back in time and be a child if you wanted to, or become older uh, again? What if you live in the ether and you never die? I ask questions basically on a daily basis. If we knew that we don't, don't have a finite life, would we still have compassion? If you can't hurt somebody, and they can come back to life 50 times in the digital world. What happens? I mean, these are the really fascinating questions we're asking ourselves. Um, but we're here in this universe to basically ask these questions. Otherwise, we wouldn't be asking them in the first place. I think these are really, really strong questions. And I, it's, a, it's a really magical time where we're seeing all this happening. We're asking these questions. We don't have answers to them. They're, they're too profound for us to even be able to comprehend. But one thing we do know is we can't stop them. We can't, we can't pause this growth uh, of technology. If we're, lead it up, if we're led on that path, and if that's where we're going, then we definitely cannot stop it. Yes? Yes? Quick question. Um, you, you brought up Einstein from the quotes, and but I see, and my view is that I see an inherent contradiction in what you were speaking about, because sure. while Einstein did say that imagination was very important. He was formally trained in the science, technology, uh, scientific approach. But what I'm hearing from you is that we shouldn't uh, inspire and push our children to do the science, the math, because the computers will code themselves. But you know, as an engineer, my experience is that if you want to create empathy in that computer, in that system, it will have to be coded. right? We have to be ahead of the computer and programming itself to ensure that those long-term issues don't come to bear because we've gotten in front of them. And a lot of that is just the hard science and math and not, and I, and I don't want to sound deprecating to the liberal arts, but there is a very different, in my mind, view of the world and an approach to thinking that occurs in those two different areas, liberal arts and the hard sciences. Thank you for your question. Uh, I think this is the first one I'm going to disagree with because uh, we're, we're, our, our laboratory is five minutes away from California Institute of Technology, which uh, I grew up with a couple of very close friends of mine are uh, quantum physicists and astrophysicists. Um, computers are doing those models now. If Einstein was born today, he would not be doing that. 
is into, you, we, what we needed to do then is different than today. That's what we're trying to explain. Is that the machines? Is, imagine saying that for a carpenter or somebody who's actually creating something today, I need to first learn how to do that. Uh, for example, I need to learn how to saw. Right? If you tell a machine to saw for you, you don't need to learn and feel what, you know how to saw anymore. That's just a tool. So mathematics was a tool at that time even though computers were around. But that's a, that, that is a profound saying by Einstein, which it's not, I'm not saying that we should just completely forget abstract thought, because mathematics is fantastic. But we should use math, basically looking at, we will not be able to compute, the, let me give you a very good example, architects. Which one of you in the room believes that an architect actually sat there and analyzed the loads on uh, the tallest building in Dubai? Do you believe that the education of, of the architects that designed that building had anything to do with him understanding the loads on that building? What do you think did the loads on that building? A machine. A computer was in, a, we coded it today, but that's exactly what I'm telling you. Coding is being done by machines. This is that profound change that is happening right now. That's where I disagree. Because coding is happening by machines. So maybe it's not going to be coding. Maybe it's going to be abstract painting that the machines are taking is trying to understand our mind. We don't know that. But I can tell you that that system of coding, by the time somebody graduates from college, I'm not, I'm not saying that if you've studied engineering and coding, it's, it's very important today. And if you are an engineer that's coding, people are relying on your intelligence and your knowledge to help progress evolution in that proper manner. But I don't think that we're going to be coding in the future. So Einstein would have uh, definitely kept the same quote, I think but he would not have studied the same amount. He would have taken it much less. Just skimmed through it. I mean, if we can actually have stuff projected into our brains through a different way of learning, perhaps that's what's going to happen. Yes. I'm sorry, microphone. I don't actually know when my... Yeah, I think I still have a little bit of time, yes? Microphone. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, Please, no difficult questions. No. <laughs> well, one, bothering me because uh, artificial intelligence and robotics seem to be destroying more jobs than creating new ones. Uh, unlike the previous revolutions where, you know, humankind was quite original and creative in finding new jobs with high level skills to replace the old ones which have been destroyed. So, uh, you know, some of the great minds like Elon Musk, uh, you mentioned Stephen Hawking and Bill Gates, they have proposed the concept of a universal basic wage for people who have been uh, left unemployed because of advances in technology. So uh, the thing which is worrying me is what happens to the people who are unemployed? I mean, just giving them a minimum wage, like a door, doesn't seem to be the answer to me. Right. Um, I certainly don't have an answer to that. I mean, these are uh, sociological, political, there's a lot of different things that are involved here. but. But I, I certainly know that in today's world, we are experiencing people that are jobless, even though machines aren't taking their jobs. And it has to do with governments, and it has to do with the way things are for five minutes. Okay. Um, so, but I do agree that to a certain de degree, certain jobs are going to be taken away. But by the same token, the guys are actually, for example, cleaning rooftops with snow that are dying, falling you know, from houses, etc., will be taken away by a drone that melts ice. So it helps humanity in a lot of ways as well. Uh, what I'm saying is that we need to start rethinking how those people will be trained uh, to work alongside machines. If they're laborers today, in my opinion, they will be okay. But I'm talking a little bit more about my child, for example, who's 10 years old. By the time he gets to 35, I want to make sure that he can actually work alongside machines. If theoretically by 2024 we're about to enter singularity, so I think that uh, it's happening too fast. It's not something that I, I of course, I have my opinions, but uh, I think that we have to really look at robotics and AI as something that can help humanity right now. It's what we use it for. What we design our robots for, it obviously, is basically to address a specific need. So, and that's that's something that is important to me. But there's companies, obviously, as you can see, <clears throat> that are creating homes uh, that have sensors on them. So this is where we need to be a little bit careful, and you need to support 
people and companies that are looking at doing things that are more um, relevant. Yes, anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Um, what's your opinion on a brain computer interface? Can you elaborate a little bit more? So, like for example, we talked about Elon Musk already. He's funding this company called Neuralink, which is just directly going to add a machine to your mind, just build on your artificial intelligence to compete with a robot because of the mathematical advantages it has. Um, integrating it into humanity. I believe that this is something that is inevitable. Uh, because in order for a factory worker to be able to work as fast as a machine or to scan things like a machine will, they will need a specific type of lens in their eye to be able to analyze the barcode immediately. So imagine a factory worker that has enhanced skills or basically is just looking at a problem with a particular object that is moving. Imagine the speed at which objects moved in a traditional factory sense, right? That basically they're looking at the pipeline of products moving. Imagine that moving a thousand times faster. A machine can recognize that, so that that factory worker will need enhancement. So I believe that that is something that is inevitable. It must happen. Whether it's fortunate or not, or if I have my opinions on what's happening. I do have one interesting thing, though. I think we need that time is almost up. Uh, I'm really curious about people who th think about terraforming space right now. I mean, no offense to any great thinkers and, and great people like Elon Musk, who are actually helping uh, you know, the globe in a profound way uh, with electric cars. By the time we actually terraform, uh, we probably will be already getting into the phase that we're talking about, the digital phase. So some of those things I think are contradictory. You know, we're trying to leave a planet while we you know, are trying to coexist and we're gonna go into a digital phase while why would we not be able to travel to another planet? So um, these are kind of interesting questions. If you take technology and kind of run with it, uh, it goes to some interesting areas. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.